it's been five days since the killing of un unarmed black teenager Michael Brown in Ferguson. Don't shoot! Hands up! 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 This is for my crowd. This is America. We were riding down Canfield. And next thing you know, I see the cop right past us. So I went to park, you know, because we were close by his house. And next thing you know, we seen, uh, I seen Mike Brown, and I also seen his friend walking with him. And you can see that the officer exchanged words with him, basically telling him to get the F on the sidewalk. So his friend said, okay, we're almost to our destination, and he reversed back, blocking both lanes. Then you can see him trying to get out the car, but he's so close to Mike Brown and his friend that he can't get out the car. So basically what he do is he reaches out of the car, out the driver's side, and he reaches for Mike Brown. Now Mike Brown is pushing off the car like, you know, he's not touching the cop, he's pushing. You know, trying to get away from the cop. The cop draws his gun and says, I'm gonna shoot you. And next thing you know, one fire was shot. That right there made him, you know, let go of Mike Brown. He took off running, him and his friend took off running, and that's when you hear another shot, pow. And you can see his body jerk. You know, you can see his body jerk, and that's when he turned around, he put his hands up, and the officer continued shooting, and he went down. Last Saturday, um, about around 12 o'clock-ish, a young man named Michael Brown was uh, murdered. He wasn't killed, he was murdered, brutally murdered. Uh, he was shot about 10 times, uh, several times, and uh, his body was out on the concrete for uh, several hours before a blanket was even placed over him. He wasn't armed, he didn't have any weapons, he was just walking down the street. No one deserves to be uh, killed the way that he was. You didn't have to shoot him in the back, and then once he turned around pleading for his life, telling you that he doesn't have a weapon, you shoot him in the face and all in the chest. Like, nobody deserves to die like that. It's hard to talk about the last week without really talking about the history of St. Louis. We are within a Midwestern city with a Southern mentality. And so you have a very uh, polarized city. You have a lot of people who may have grown up, especially in North County, because it, probably in the 70s and the 80s it was more integrated. There was a lot of white flight that happened, but it was still integrated through the 80s and then maybe the early part of the 90s. Uh, and then when the flight had kind of went towards the end of where it was, you had a lot of people from North City who may have moved to North County, and now you have a predominantly uh, black community. But politically, you still have that historic white power structure. And so you may have a town that has uh, what they say a two-third majority, but the mayor, the chief of police, the majority of the police department, the city attorney, the city prosecutor, the people who run the government, the city council, who make those political decisions that will affect that group are predominantly whites. And so when we look at the last week, it looks like chaos, but that's because it's been brewing. You have this group that's numerically becoming a minority, or a majority rather, but politically it doesn't have any power. And without that power, it's not able to determine its destiny and where it's going. Now, for the first time that I can think of in a long time, St. Louis has the eyes of the nation on it. And particularly the community of Ferguson, which is a part of St. Louis County, uh, which is a part of the greater St. Louis metropolitan area. And so now what you have is, is that individuals who've been looking for a voice and looking for an opportunity to say what's going on, what they're feeling, what's happening in their community, the eyes of the nation are there, and now they're gonna speak out. This is the site where we're actually gonna start. This is where the incident took place. We're gonna march up here, it's gonna occur. We're gonna come out, we're gonna go down here. I think Sweetie Pies is right in bound here somewhere. But we're gonna stop the crowd, right? <laughs> we're gonna stop the crowd. Uh, Sweetie Pies, yeah, there you go. Um, basically, we're gonna stop the crowd, there's gonna be some chanting, I mean, uh, uh, for our speech, and then we're gonna continue to come back. Give me the signal. No justice! No peace! No justice! No peace! No justice! No peace! Hold on, hold on. Stay with the place. We stay organized. If you organize, you will win. You see where uh, Brother Michael Brown was actually shot. And it's a, a, a two lane street. Uh, and the housing the apartments are right there. Uh, 
to see that happen, uh, a, a youth that everyone knew to get shot down like that uh, and then left on the street for four hours uh, really intensifies the anger that has already been there. What we wanted to do is to basically bring a little bit more organization to it, a little bit more organizing, so to really not have people just stand out on the street. If we can get people educated a little bit more on how you effectively use people power in a very organized way, then we can actually get our point across a lot more clear. One of the main things that's been going on for years that, you know, it, it wasn't until this incident, unfortunately, that, you know, people really want to start to band together. We're all trying to come together and coalesce um, into something that can use as demonstrations that can forever have remittances or um, rumblings for voting actions, um, police accountability. I've been working with um, different groups of young people to, you know, have a space where they can you know, voice the things that they want to see and start working to make change, make the police force more transparent and accountable, um, change the economy of the area so people have living wage jobs, um, and, you know, just change the environment so people aren't living in fear every day. It doesn't matter how you get around the table. All that matters is you get called to dinner. And we have to right what's wrong in America. We have to stand up on principles. We have mothers who are there to protect their children, to, to laugh with their children, to celebrate their children, not to go to their funerals. The people are looking. And when you have their attention, you have the ability to influence. Don't shoot! Don't shoot! One of the things is that, you know, the police, uh, specifically uh, St. Louis County, uh, has came up very, in, in a very military posture. Uh, and when you come with the, uh, I guess, prepared for a riot, then uh, a lot of times, you know, the mentality of some police is to actually uh, engage things as though there is a riot going on. I will fucking kill you. Get back. Get back. Get back. Put your gun down. Get back. What are you doing? Stop pointing it. Days throughout turned into a militarized police state, which is definitely uncalled for. Uh, people were being shoot rubber, shot rubber bullets. People were being uh, handcuffed. Journalists at McDonald's at the Washington Post and Huffington Post illegally detained um, their cameras and illegally detained their bodies. Um, so right now, people are just trying to stand up for the rights, but they're being used by, they're being looked at as combatants um, as war, in war time, but they're citizens of the United States of America. Neither extreme works. The police will say, you know what, when we come aggressively and forcefully, and again, you got to remember the historic part of, of what's happening, when an officer stops someone and the first words out of his mouth is, show me your ID, get out the street, you're going to have those raw emotions that come up that says, I haven't had your foot in my back for 200 years. And then people will respond in a way that may not be respectful. It may not be, uh, you know, ideal. Just like a lot of times when someone goes into a new area or a new territory, there's going to be uncertainty and fear. People are afraid of what they don't understand. And so because of these officers who were trying to do their job but not understanding that these 13, 14, and 15 year olds are loud, but they don't pose as danger. They may cuss at me, but they're not swinging at me. They are protesting loudly, maybe not peacefully in the idea of some people, but they're not being violent. What's happening is, is that you have people who are peacefully partying after hours, you have the horns that are blowing. Some may be blowing to say, get out of the way. Some may be blowing because I got the eyes of the country and I want this attention. And some are blowing in support, and you hear it right now. Some people are blowing in support of the Mike Brown issue. But when it's 10, 11, 12 o'clock at night, and you're in a part of town where people are trying to sleep, technically that's a public nuisance. Some people who just, you know, sometimes we have some of these anarchists that are around and they want to start uh, what they call the revolution, right? And so they may throw the first brick or something through a window or to shoot fireworks or something in that nature to really get the uh, crowd uh, aggregated. 
tensions have been rising. It's like a powder keg. And once that powder keg lights, boom. Um, so this has been happening. So people throughout the, the, you know, the, um, the world have identified that dealing with the militarized police state, that not only during the wartime or during uh, peace times of protest they come out, but during the day, um, during their everyday lives, they feel like they're under surveillance or under subjugation. People are already pissed off and are, you know, taking to the streets. And um, when, when people tell them, you know, what to do, um, it's going to make them more angry. Now what's happening is, and, and I noticed this, is that the tone from the national media changed. Once the video footage was released, the national media changed. And the national media is controlling a lot of the, uh, I guess, the, the, the understanding that people are getting about what's happening in Ferguson. But we've seen this happen before. The way that the information has been released by the police department, the people who originally had control of the investigation and what they are releasing, uh, I think it's been very strategic. I think that it violated the principles of transparency early on. And, and so people look at that and then the narrative has now been set. This guy was a suspect. He's a bad guy. You see this intimidating force on this video camera and the images are going out. You're not just seeing Mike Brown and relating to the same dead kid you saw laying in the street without his body covered. You're seeing Mike Brown, the bully, the superhero who after stealing these Swisher Sweets went down the street, confronted the police officer, opened up his car door, got inside the car, beat him a couple of times, tried to grab his gun and then suddenly said, oh, I need to flee. An hour later, the word comes out, well, no, he didn't stop him because he was a suspect. He had no knowledge of this robbery. So nothing in his mind at the time of the initial stop was related to the robbery. But the narrative now from the media is, oh, this is a game changer because now it may be justified. We're not looking at the absurdity of that story the way that we would had we not seen that video tape. How could it be reasonable in the mind of this officer that this person had just committed a violent felony and may present a threat if he knew nothing about that threat at the time of the initial stop? gone down like Mike Brown, they wouldn't put the fact that I model and I support those with cancer and alopecia as myself. They wouldn't they wouldn't promote that shit. What they would do is they would bring up my past and put out there that I've been to the penitentiary twice. You know what I'm saying? They're not gonna they're not gonna show that I was a good mom. You know, they're not gonna show that I take care of my son on a daily basis and I go to work and I work hard to support those with cancer and be the voice for little kids that have alopecia. You don't see them recording that we're out here being peaceful. You know what I'm saying? You don't see them recording shit right now. But as soon as the police come out here with their gas guns, shooting tear gas and shit like that, that's when the camera's gonna cut on. That is what they're gonna show all over the freaking world. They put they make it seem like we're animals and we're shit starters and this is what we wanted. Don't just scrutinize one side, scrutinize both sides objectively. And if you're gonna ask hypotheticals based off of information you don't know, then ask the hypotheticals on the other side. Can we really believe that this guy is, uh, never had any disciplinary complaints just because his chief said it? Because a disciplinary action taken against someone doesn't mean that there hadn't been reports filed against someone. It, it, it can be very misleading to say someone's never had any disciplinary action taken against him unless you ask the question, what, were there any disciplinary complaints? Did anyone make a complaint against him? Is How does he talk? What's his demeanor like? Don't just ask the chief. Ask the three black Ferguson police officers about this guy. Interview them. And, and and get a more balanced portrait. Ask some of the people in the community and say, hey, have you had any run-ins with this particular officer? This is not the first time Wilson has literally started mess with other female, other people. You know, he recently, a month prior to Mike Brown's murder, a girl got maced and she ran into the Quick Trip, which is right here. And the employees were trying to give her milk, support her eyes, stop the burning, or water, anything, stop the burning. Wilson walks in and says, you put that fucking milk in your eye, you're going to jail. You know, like, why are you harassing people in this area? 
questions or doubts are now being raised about what the officer did. Those who have a filter up are only going to see the bad. They're not going to see the fair, they're not going to see the good, they're only going to see the bad. People here in this area from Ferguson want justice for Mike Brown. They're not trying to mess up their own community, which they have to live in. It doesn't make sense. Have you ever heard of Bull Connors? I grew up with George Wallace and Bull Connors. And even though 55 years later, I'm 62, we're still dealing with the same situation. So I wanted to say no justice, no peace, no. No racist police. But if you have justice and you have peace, you don't have racist police. But I don't feel like it's going to be just. They're not going to get him a proper sentence because if they were trying to get justice, if the police were really trying to help us get justice, they would never release that video at the same time of releasing his name. They're trying to help the cop out instead of helping Mike Brown family. I don't think it's going to be safe for my son here. And that's why I'm going to leave. I can't protect him from everything, but I don't have to have him living here. And I won't. But I am going to be here until justice is served. That's it. Both. Even though we feel it doesn't matter, our vote doesn't count, look at the White House. How did he get there? Look at Eric Holder. He wouldn't have been be there if Obama wasn't there. So your vote does count. It's the only thing that really does.